Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is architect Richard Landry and artistic director ballerina Natalia Middleston. Richard Landry was born and raised in rural Quebec. It was farm country. He went to the University of Montreal where he earned a BA and then he got a diploma in architecture uh, from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, is that right? That's correct. <laughs> Richard left a large architectural firm in Canada and started his own firm in Los Angeles. What actually brought you here? It's interesting because I typically tell people it was because of the beach. I just uh, wanted to come and see the sunny California. Uh, the reality is I like to be where the action is and uh, Canada in 1984 was getting kind of slow and Los Angeles oh. was just on the edge of booming so I just came oh. to LA. Well, in Canada, you worked on a lot of commercial properties, and which is totally different from what you're working on here. That's Did you start in commercial here? No, actually, when I first came to Los Angeles, I worked with a firm, a fairly large firm uh, called Art Duel and Associates. They were doing theme parks. I was uh, working in a large theme park there. Here? They were responsible for Magic Mountain and Knott's oh. Berry Farm. And I was always intrigued by theme architecture. So oh. I came down here and did that for about like nine sets. months. Like set sets designs, in a, exactly. Set design in a way. Yeah, and I did that for about nine months. Then uh, there was a new firm in LA that had heard about me that was actually specializing in high-end residential. And they called me up and asked me if I would go and work for them. And the challenge was interesting. So I basically moved down to that firm and worked there for about two years on large homes. When you were working in Canada, you were... A, a specialist, I would say, or you really looked into public... Um, I was a project architect working on all types of projects, but mainly but in, commercial in, projects. In, uh, disabled. Uh, I've done... Disabled access was correct. something that... You, so that must have helped you when you were doing the theme parks. You yeah, have when you work within the, within the more kind of uh, commercial uh, type of architecture, uh -huh. you have to deal with a lot of ADA. But you yeah. don't have to work, worry about that now in your big houses, do you? Actually, you'd be surprised. A lot of our clients are thinking, well, you know, like when I get older, do I want to deal with steps? Do I want to have an elevator inside the house? Uh -huh. So there's a lot Is of issues right? like that that still apply. Hmm. Yeah. Or they uh, have older people living with them and they want to make sure that the house is accessible. So we have done houses with accessible showers and accessible bathrooms oh. and so forth. Yeah. Well, so that uh, work, that research work you did in Canada really came in handy. Is it the they, same? It must be. It's the same kind of codes, but yeah. all the research comes handy. I think you just develop a background and you keep working with it. Um, when you came here, did you see yourself going right into houses? No, it was <laughs> actually, I think, more of a coincidence. I've always liked doing houses, but I was mainly exposed to hospitals and shopping centers and uh, uh, schools. Uh, I'd never done a house before. Is that right? Never did one. Well, so. architects are usually known for like a particular project that they do. Mm -hmm. Like they'll drive down, you'll drive down the street and say Frank Gehry did that's that right, or Richard right. Meyer did that. Or, yeah. um, what do you think about that? Well, what's interesting is many architects have a signature. They have an architectural style yes. that's really them. Uh, I believe it's different with us. We don't, I like to tell people I don't have a signature. We do a very wide spectrum of architectural styles. I've done everything from neoclassical to the French country and the Tuscan to the very contemporary. And I like that. I think the common thread to all of this, though, is the, the, the level of attention that we pay to the details uh, and how we actually work with the clients in developing their specific dreams. But it's interesting that it takes the ego out of your work. And I think it projects and focuses on your client. Mm -hmm. It and, does. Uh, uh, because what actually, you're saying, yeah. doing a house is so personal. Uh, that I don't see myself in telling them this is how you should live. Uh, I like to ask tons of questions, listen to them, uh, know their lifestyle, how they're going to live in the house on a daily basis, how they would live in the house, uh, how they do parties and things like this, how they see themselves in that house in 10 years. How does that client get along with you? I would think that's the really the 
hardest relationship to have. But the best, I think, because <laughs> in a way, that's why I think a lot of architects shy away from yes. the residential architecture. I love it because uh, to me, that's where you get most personal with your clients. They're going to live in this house, sleep in this house, so and be in there every single day. You've, you've made maybe a hundred and... 80 houses or something Actually, in 15 or 16, 17 years. Over 250. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps growing. It really, um, that's a lot of houses. Those are, that's a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. And you've brought to us something uh, that we've heard about you, that you're the architect to the stars. I, you know, I, it's funny people say that. Uh, I think people like this Hollywood kind of thing, but most of our clients are not... Uh, superstars or celebrities, but I, I actually, what's funny is I look at all of them as being stars, though. Yeah, because, uh, but no, you've done like Gretz, uh, Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky, Gretzky just Rod Stewart, Wayne. Kenny G, um, who else? Um, Eddie Murphy. I'm sure you can tell me much more. But the interesting thing is you must have to deal with them totally differently than other uh, clients. Um, do you yes. deal actually with them or with their people? Oh, deal, you know, it's funny. We deal directly with them. <laughs> In because Hollywood, with their, people. Them, with their people. <laughs> for them, it's a very personal project. And uh, it's interesting because people would think, well, you maybe work a lot more with their business managers or those type of people. But no, they love their creative process. So they want to be a part of it. So we really get to meet with them and ask all the, the same question. We deal with them the same way, really, as I will deal with, with the businessmen. You uh, have, uh, they must have certain needs like, they, they need art to be hung. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you accommodate that? Or they have trophies, or they, like the, um, the, athle the athletes have That's trophies, right. or yeah. Academy Awards, That's or whatever. Right. That's do, right. Those are fun. Well, we those? have, like in uh, Wayne Gretzky's house, there's, uh, there's what we call the trophy room, but really uh, it's kind of a pub. There's a beautiful bar, there's a pool table, uh -huh. and that's the display room. So he would display a lot of his uh, specific things in so, there. A house we did for Sugary Leonard uh, also has a trophy room, and uh, it's nice to find a proper place to display those things, actually. You talked about different facades. Mm -hmm. This is a, a house with a, I don't know, tell us what the facade is. Actually, this is. is more of an English manner. It's a house that we did in Seattle for Kenny G. And is it on an island? Is it's, that what um, I remember? I can't tell you exactly oh, where it I, is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the tough thing with what I do is a lot of times we can't talk but about some of the projects. But he wanted a particular but style? Is, yeah, actually Kenny loved the uh, Greystone Mansion and oh. this was actually based on that. And then this, and this is, is part of the entry for IA. It's a very beautiful, sexy staircase going up. And uh, so, yeah. what would you research? Greystone? Is that what you would research? Uh, or you go in to In this England case, or? we walk together. You know, we have tons of books. There's so many great books with pictures of uh, historical architecture out there. So, there's a lot to learn. And, and since and we're talking about mm -hmm. the facades, I have another facade. This is yeah. totally different. Yeah, this is French now. It's more of a French manor and or French chateau, if you want. This house is in town here. And uh, we have a cut French limestone with a slate roof. And that's what's fun with what we do. Every day is different. How Every can, client is different. How can people live in such huge houses? Do they use the, all these rooms? They use every single room. It's <laughs> funny, people ask that. They, most of these people entertain a lot. Uh, this is a they Hollywood have, mogul. They have may family. I say. <laughs> they have family with them. Not allowed to say. <laughs> I know, but but it's it's like uh, someone who would entertain. But yeah, you and know, this is in his house as well. Yeah, and what what happens? You have a lot of great things. You have every bedroom as as its own bathroom and its own walk-in closet. So you have a lot of practical things in it. And this was an interesting thing. Uh, this client actually enjoy eating sushi. So they said, Richard, why don't we create the proper place to eat sushi rather than doing it in the dining room? So this is your you have your own little tatami room so you come down the hallway and you go over this little bridge and there's water that goes underneath oh, it then great. you sit on the floor just like in a real uh, Japanese restaurant. And he has a, a sushi so, chef come in? Uh, he has a great chef yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show the rest of these pictures because sure. I think they're so interesting. It's fun. Um, so we do all the architectural uh, and interiors. And you do the interior on too? Not the furniture and the window covering, but the architectural interiors. So all like the wood ceilings and the built-ins, uh, fireplace designs, moldings, special How ceilings. How do you work with the architects? Then do you work with, with an the We work with, the, we work I mean, with interior, interior designers. I'm yeah, sorry. We're the architect, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry. Okay. Uh, we work with interior designers and uh, we work very well with them because uh, many of them like to focus on the furniture, the 
their window coverings and we work hand in hand with them. There's a place so, where we kind of bridge over with them. Would they tell you before we're going to, would you tell them before we're going to do this huge window and would you have it some depends, idea of what it? It always depends. Every project is different. So sometimes the interior designer comes in even before we are selected on the project and sometimes they come in much later. So if they're there from the beginning, we invite them to attend all the meetings that we have with the owner and for them to be a part of it. So we can discuss the window and the little right. built-in. Does the that. owner choose the uh, interior designer? Some owners come with an interior designer that they worked with in a previous project. Sometimes they ask me to refer people. Oh, so we'll give you? them the name of five or six people or who we thought would be the most appropriate uh, for the architectural style. I so see. we actually work with them on that. So yeah. then do they follow the project as you start building? Would an interior designer stay with you and follow the project? Yeah, yeah. they often attend site meetings during the construction. We welcome their comments. Like you said before, I think you said something very nice. There's no egos involved. We don't allow egos. Uh, it's really, it's more about the client working as a team and giving them the best possible project. There's well, when you're simple. not putting your, the, the thing that you're putting on it, is good quality mm -hmm. and good uh, materials, mm -hmm. and you're making sure they get the design they want. There's a lot of knowledge. I think the background of specializing in high-end residential, we really know and understand what goes in those homes. And But there's also more than one way of doing things. There's not just one way of going after doing like a very specific we house. Showed, so. We showed all of the other things, English and French, right. and you've done Mediterranean, yes. Spanish. Uh, this is totally different yeah. to me. <laughs> this is contemporary. So, and we love and contemporary also. you have no problem also. doing this? I love contemporary. Uh, what it is, very few clients relate to that. They can say, yes, this is beautiful, but it's not for me. So maybe one out of ten of our client is going contemporary. And so what would the facade of this house be? Um, I should have brought the picture for you. Oh, uh, it's a very contemporary facade, actually, and nice big windows. Uh, it's really, it's a different composition. When you work with the more traditional type of architecture, you research it. The, you, there's a lot of precedence that you can follow. With contemporary, it's like you create your own architectural language. So what you, about the site? Does the site this, enter in? Absolutely. You, that's what the, one of the very first thing that we do is walk the site with the client, document the site, look at the views, look at what the sun does, look at the prevailing winds, uh -huh. uh, look at the access, look at the noise. There's so many things that you have to take into consideration. So it's multi-layered and we have to bring everything together at the same time. I don't believe in compromising a floor plan for the sake of the aesthetics. So everything to me works at the same time. One, one thing before we go, who is your favorite architect? Oh <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, I have a lot of favorites. You know, I admire what Frank Gehry has done with the Disney Hall. I think it's fantastic. Um, and uh, I have a lot of uh, older traditional architects like I Meisner, I think, is a great architect. Yeah. We have a lot of his book. Wallace Neff is fantastic. Beautiful. Edwin Lachin. So we're inspired by a lot of them. So you're inspired by the gamut. But From yeah, absolutely, the because depending on where we work, and also what's fun is I might be doing a very contemporary house, but have learned something about volumes in a traditional home that I could bring into that project, so. Now, let me just ask you before we leave, what kind of a house do you live in? Ah, uh, you know what? It's funny. I live in a barn. Oh, uh, do you? <laughs> I Back actually, to your farmhood? Yes. Uh, your farm I, childhood? I have a piece of land uh, in Malibu and um, oh, went great. to Quebec, bought a 100-year-old barn uh, uh -huh. that was about two months from my parents' house, brought all this wood to California, but instead of recreating the barn, I used the barn wood in a contemporary context. Oh, very so, good. So it's a very interesting house. I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard Landry. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part of the show. Don't go away because we'll be back with Natasha Middleton. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Natasha Middleton was born and raised in Los Angeles. She attended Valley Professional School, was a member of the Joffrey's Second Company in New York City, danced with the Pacific Ballet Theater, and is now artistic director of the Media City Ballet in Burbank. You have some heavy influences in your background, Natasha. Oh, Tell yes. us about that, your grandmother, your father, your family. Yes, I am three generations of um, ballet dancers, choreographers, teachers, directors, uh, movie actors. It's from, amazing. From everywhere? From everywhere. From, do they start in Europe? 
Uh, yes, originally um, in Russia, and then worked their way down, into, of course, into Los Angeles. So it's uh, a wonderful family following. On my on my mother's side, they're all from Sicily, and they had um, opera companies as well. So oh, is that right? I have a wonderful variety. Do you sing? Yes, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to show this, because I think this is a little bit of the background, right? Will you yes. just tell us a little bit about... Well, the picture there with the beautiful scenic background, that is my grandmother, Elena Wartova, dancing with her son, my, my father, Andre Tremaine, and they were doing the uh, Nutcracker. This on one Potter over Jenner. here? Yes, they were. And then this one? That is my father with Cynthia Gregory. It's, it's, she's about um, 16 years old in that photo, and my father was one of her, her teachers, and she became the uh, prima ballerina that represented the United States with American Ballet Theater. Oh, so, so he was with American Ballet Theater? No, he was one of her coaches here in Los Angeles. Is that right? Right. And, but she ended up going on to the American Ballet Theater. And where was your grandmother dancing in that? My grandmother, at that time, she was um, start, had her own company, um, a local in Los Angeles. And, oh, um, she did? She did. What was it called? It was a Santa Monica Opera and Ballet, and then my father took over, and, be, and it became Santa Monica Opera and Ballet after that. Oh, how great. And it worked its way to Pacific Ballet Theater. So, now, we have you going to, to Valley Professional School. Yes. Why did you do that? And, and then tell us um, all the other people who were at that school. Um, by 16 years old, I was already a professional ballerina, so I needed to, um, I needed to go to a school that I could um, do my homework, just like the children who were on the set. Um, who was in that school with me? That was... Um, Ty and Randy Gardner, Ty, no, Ty, Ty Baleona, sorry, and Randy Gardner. Um, the, uh, skaters. The skaters, the very well-known skaters, and um, um, Janet Jackson. The people in the arts, so it was That's all right. just people in the people arts? People in the arts, exactly. And then, uh, and from that school, where did you go? From there I went with my father and my mother to Europe, and also to New York. So it was, it was time for me to to, to, to branch out, but it was also with my father's ballet company, so I was very busy already, you know, preparing uh, for all the roles that I was uh, learning. Was that Pacific Ballet or Santa Monica? Pacific Ballet. Pacific Ballet. Yes. So you were a uh, prima ballerina. Do you yes. think there was any nepotism there, or did you have to really work hard? I had to work hard. Did he yeah, make you work hard? There were no favorites, no. <laughs> no, I wish. I would, would have been nice, but actually at the same time I appreciate it because um, as a teacher now I also um, make sure that I don't take, um, I take, I have that same type of, of, um, of step to get one child to understand that they're not any different from anyone else. Everybody has uh -huh. to work for the same goal. I don't like to take favorites. Either. So you're very strict. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's the way your background was. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you studied under a lot of different teachers, I presume. Yes. And especially in Europe. And who were some of the, the teachers you studied with? In Europe, I studied under um, Rosella Hightower in France. Oh, yeah. And I also studied with um, Stella Mann in England. And um, we had the opportunity um, to uh, study for a short time at um, the Stuttgart Ballet mm. before John Cranko had passed away. So, so you actually were in classes with John? Or, I mean, he was teaching on stage or he was choreographing? He was choreographing, uh -huh. yeah. The school was separate. The school was separate, but, but you did some of his work? No, I was too young still at that time. I was just just about, you know, you have to go by where, where I am and where, where that was. But I was inspired tremendously by him, I think, as a choreographer, which is what I am oh, now I today. Oh, I see. Now you're, you're doing choreography. Yes. But I want to go back to what each one of these, like the Stella in um, England. Was she in England? Yes. What, what did she bring to your background? Let's talk about what different teachers bring to... Um, making a ballerina? Well, I think th the Royal Ballet School, which is where she was based out of originally, they stress a lot on the feet and the cicchetti technique. Which so, is? Which is the, um, the traditional Italian technique. Um, and uh, uh, where precision of the feet and the arms and placement of the arms is really stressed more. As where um, the Russian method is also, of course, feet, arms, placement, but very 
much stressed on um, huge jumps, very high extensions. The, the British for a long time were doing uh, the legs at only at like a 90 degree angle for many years and then eventually they went above to like the 190. Is that like Russian then? Where the right, yes, where the Russian influence came in and took over on that. And then with the Chiquetti, how do you do it with your hands? Because I'm sure you teach with your hands, do you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you demonstrate yeah. with your hands. <laughs> I remember Tan Tanya Rybushinska used to always uh, do it with her hands. Right. But is that, is uh, the... That's showing the movement, like if there's a brush, brush movement, or if there's a change of the feet, yeah, uh -huh. it shows that way. Right, very very much of a, of a structure. But it's stressed, um, the chiquetti is stressed mostly on the, on the feet, so... Um, it's a lot of battements tendus, a lot of battements frappés, battements dégagés, you know, which um, are actual foot exercises, feet exercises. Those are, those are during school time, during bar time, at during the, the bar, exercise. At the bar. And then do you include those in yes, your choreography? In my choreography? Um, it depends on, on what I'm giving. If, if, it's, um, uh, if it's very slow, such as les feet, then of course it's, it's all arms with very, very delicate feet. But if it's, let's say, it's... Um, a very fast allegro, uh, yeah, oh, very much so. It would be all those, the feet and the arms. Depending but on is style. that how you do the choreography? I never figured out how choreographers work, what they do, how they do it. Well, we're first inspired by the music. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you just, you select your dancers and take it from there. And Oh, then you select the dancers. Right. And then, and then how do you choreograph the music? Well, with the dancers? With the dancers, right. Oh, you do. Exactly. A lot of, I'll have a basic idea of what I want ahead of time, but um, I will also you know, look at my dancers and see you know, what, what is going to work the best for them. And, and that probably depends on what they can do, their capabilities. Exactly. Well, like recently in, um, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in spring, I set the ballet Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number no. 3. And that is done in three movements. So the ballet was very, very classical, but with a little bit of a neoclassical touch to it. So as a choreographer, I had to decide uh, in three movements how these dancers were going to show the different emotions that we chose for the three movements. Then you pick a, a dancer that you think will be good with the music, exactly. I guess. And then you put them through the... the um, what the movements that you choose that I choose, right? Well, which are usually very, um, very intricate. Hard I was going to say, do you, do they do they become harder and harder? Yes, they do, and so it's 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 more demanding on the dancers. Um, so these dancers must be, you know, highly trained. You know, they have to be have excellent technique, a good feeling with music. They have to be sort of musicians themselves in many ways. So. Um, it's it's much harder the, for the dancer nowadays than uh, it was many years ago. You choreographed a lot in opera, musical, yes. theater. Is there a difference? Oh, a tremendous difference. Um, I think with the with the opera, um, you know, the, you're going with with what is set for the for the opera, such as like if it's a waltz or depending on what is what it is. But the dancer must you know still also be the ballet dancer, but. For the for musicals, um, it's nice. To, I always pick pick people who have you know ballet backgrounds, which is very important because I know that I'm dealing with dancers with you know who can have a decent technique, <laughs> but they have to be great performers, great, very mm. open, very out there. It's 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 just like going beyond the nine dots, you know, so. <laughs> very um, exciting, you know. So I love it. I'm very 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 uh, much from musical theater. I like Adore musical it. theater too, but I like ballet. Yes. In, in 2001, you became artistic director of a new ballet company called Media Arts. Media City Ballet. Media City Ballet. Right. I don't know, I keep wanting to say arts. Tell me what Media City is. Well, Media City is, it's in the Burbank Media City area there. It's an actual village oh, there. Oh, they call it Media, Media City? City. Mm -hmm. Oh, I right. see. I didn't right. know that. And my studio is, in, is located there. So I decided um, to name the ballet company after the Media City Ballet of Burbank. So oh, I named Media City and stress that. And um, it's been wonderful. It's been about uh, two and a half years now. And um, we're off to a great start. Um, I'm able to take everything from my background and incorporate it into into this company. So that's what an artistic director does? Yes. 
And and I know every ballet company does the Nutcracker. What do you bring to the Nutcracker that's different than any other people? You brought us a, a Nutcracker today. Yes, I did. <laughs> but what do, you, what do you bring that's like your touch? Well, I danced Clara many times, and I think that I understood her character. So I stress a lot on the the dream that she is having and what is she, what is she what is her desire you know to and and the the um uh, what she feels for the nutcracker and, and playing off the two of them a lot uh -huh. yeah he was he was my pal He's a good for one. a long time yeah yeah and i think that um uh every little girl can relate I, I, not only just every little girl but i want every person to relate to what she's feeling and what she's what she's going through and how we all love that hero in our life and how we all want to also uh -huh. be a, some sort of a heroine ourself. <laughs> um, I, but also the, the choreography that I have is based on um, Old Ballet Russe. Oh, because you had, your grandmother was uh, involved Ex with the Ballet Russe. Exactly, and I'm using a lot of the choreography that my um, father had said. But we have to do a lot of updating, you know, nowadays because these dancers are just so <laughs> tremendous. You know, they can do these three, four thousand oh, turns do, in one spot. You know? They can do great yes, things now? Yes. That's yes. really good. You have an a associate director, yes, Ruben Tenoyan. Ruben Tenoyan, yes. And what are his, does he work with you or does he take people separately? Or He's one of, he's one of my coaches. Um, he, he sets um, ballets separately, you know, f f at different times of the season. But when it comes to Nutcracker, he will, he will take the principles. Uh, the principal, the sugar plum, uh, the fairy, her cavalier, um, snow king, snow queen, and he will actually just set oh, everything and coach, them. and coach them. He will coach Clara. Um, he is from uh, originally from the um, Armenian National Opera Ballet, and he was also trained in f with the Kirov Ballet School. So is he a good dancer as well? Oh, he was. I mean, he was. Yes. <laughs> well, he, he he still is. <laughs> he still is. It's just he chooses to strictly teach and, and coach, but oh, phenomenal. And I'm very fortunate. Um, um, the classic. Tchaikovsky comes out really from the Ballet Russe, I yes. think, doesn't it? Yes. They like go hand in hand. Oh, they go hand in hand. I think one thing about the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo that a lot of people don't realize is that George Balanchine came out of that, who made New York City Ballet. Um, Leon Danielin came out of that, who made American Ballet Theater. Right. So it just, it's the chain just keeps going. So it's wonderful. Who made Pacific Ballet Theater, Who who's now bringing Media City Ballet. It, it just it just keeps going. That's great. Through Ballet we, Russe, we keep so. going too, and it all came through the Ballet Russe. Thank and you, I, Natasha thank Middleton. You so much. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next time. You'll find out where to write at the end of the pick at the end of the show. <laughs>